war in Southeast Asia. Devastation, suffering, terror, pathos, senseless, hopeless, depraved. War that is never finished, leaving behind a frenzy of reasons for new wars to redress the damage of old wars. War that mutilates the body and reason the unutterable loneliness of war, the final humiliation. War anywhere. Now, gentlemen, to sum up very quickly this short conference, reports indicate that the enemy have landed, as they have in the past months, but this time they are in greater strength. <laughs> We have been ordered to carry out a contingency plan and sail in that vicinity and land the commander group uh, in that area. The coastal strip has been photographed, landing sites and beaches have been seen. And incidentally, Colonel, in this respect, you will be giving some help. Yes, that's right. The special boat section will be landing after dark tonight. We'll have a good look at the beaches. And as soon as they've found out what they wish to find, and they will let us know by a uh, signal. Good. The Captain Guy Morgan, DSO, is summing up this conference with the heads of departments and Colonel Goulet, Royal Marines. Nearly four weeks ago, Bulwark embarked Marine Commandos 4-0 and 4-2 under Colonels Ian Gourlay and John Tamplin, together with all transport and arms. 4-0 and 4-2 Royal Marine Commandos have already served with distinction in the jungles of Borneo, Sarawak and the deserts of the Middle East. Lieutenant Ray Ingram, Royal Marines, serves in Bulwark and is part of a small permanent liaison party. Seasoned trained men, individualists, combined into a fused integrated group. Bullock is a commando ship of some 22,000 tons. First commissioned October 1954 as a light fleet strike carrier, she was converted to the commando role January 1960. She has spent most of her working life east of Suez. Just over four weeks ago, we slipped to sea to join the remainder of the task force. It was a grey, humid, heavy, hot day. There were no fanfares, no pomp. It was a job. Over 700 feet long, she was the first ship to become a commando carrier. She has 845 Squadron Wessex helicopters. Under thy wings will I trust. Forty-eight hours later, we joined this vast task force under the command of Rear Admiral Hill Norton. It includes strike carriers Victorious and Eagle, Australian carrier Melbourne, Commando carrier Bulwark, guided missile destroyers Kent and London, destroyers Barroso, Carrisfoot, Corona, Caesar, Lincoln, Derwin, Royal New Zealand ship Otago. That's victorious. That's Kent, the guided missile destroyer. Why were we here? Intelligence had given detailed and accurate reports of an aggressive state's massive build-up of troops and supplies aimed at a friend. Yet we have had to wait until call. So here we are in a strategic area steaming in an apparently aimless pattern. Lieutenant Commander Sean McPhail, second in command flying, responsible for all takeoffs, landings, etc. Major Tony Eyre, Royal Marines, and Commander Bulwark's Marine Liaison Party. Successful embarkation of troops into helicopters will be his special responsibility.
waiting, training, waiting. Waiting for the call for urgent aid. Diplomats waited, the politicians waited, we waited in a strategic area and hoped. Like fire engines waiting as an airfield for a crippled aircraft to land. We hope, but are ready. Today we have been told we have hoped in vain. This is your special correspondent with HMS Victorious. We're now racing at over 30 knots to the rendezvous. On the right is the Miller landing gear. This guides the pilot onto the flight deck. This is the Buccaneer, the Navy's most modern strike aircraft. The arrest of wire can stop you from 140 mile per hour in less than 200 feet. A stop like that gives you the nasty feeling your guts have been blown to the sea behind you. a developed and proven aircraft. Controlling aircraft onto this puckishly unstable platform, one every 20 seconds, demands a detailed knowledge of aircraft and crews. Every landing needs accurate, split-second timing. I once heard a flight deck likened to a friendly dog. The aircraft, a small kittens, jumping and landing on its back, and the dog not quite sure whether to shake them off or not. This, of course, is Gannet, to a mature lady, now mainly used for anti-submarine patrol. Strike carriers are screaming, noisy boot. Jets belching the challenge of exultant power with eardrum bursting ferocity. Lip bells clang, the thump of heavy aircraft landing, the heat, the stench of abgas. Captain Davenport, OB in command of Victorious. Time to get to the area, pilot. Uh, 2230, sir. Well, I don't want to hang around here too long. Whilst we're racing to the battle area, let me recap on the situation. The enemy has struck in two places. One, an advanced area deep in the jungle. The Royal Marine Commandos 4 and 4 2 and Bubo captured a cate and destroyed this elusive, well equipped, vicious force. The Victorious is sending her sea vixens to cover the assault landing. Once we have covered the Marines' landing, we steam like a scolded cat to the second area, about 100 miles north. Here, on the open plains, the enemy's main heavily armed force is streaming through in great strength. Vixens, which will cover Bulwark's Marines landing tomorrow. Our strike aircraft, together with HMS Eagles, must blast and stop this modern force. It's here that the Buccaneers will prove themselves. Once the enemy's been stopped, we intend putting in more Marines and bringing in the army. And we have two clear airstrips for the RAF. This is Robert Barr. You've heard how the task force has been at sea for over four weeks. This means that all its stores, fuel, food and equipment has had to be brought to it. This is the work of the Royal Fleet Auxiliaries. This tanker, Royal Fleet Auxiliary Tidepool, is but one of the ships, at least ten for this venture. She is just about to refuel HMS Kent. The two ships are locked and linked like Siamese twins by these pipes. One slight error could mean a major sea disaster. In this time, several thousand gallons of fuel will be pumped into her. Like a circus act, each trick becomes more difficult. Here are three ships locked together, a carrier, a frigate, and a tanker. Bulwark's Ops Room, the ship's nerve center. Ops Officer Lieutenant Commander Ninian Old is for the Captain Royal Marines. With your beaches, Queen yes, Green, Queen Red, the two landing sites, Blue One and Blue Three, yes. the prominent features close to them, Eagle's Claw and Vulture's Beak, <coughs> the road running south, 
and the river, of course, or rivers, which we shan't use in the early stages, but we may be using them later on. Yes. Uh, not very much information about the enemy as yet. Weak battalion in the area. We hope to know rather more from your SBS boys in the submarine. This is the Chief Petty Officer's bar. It's all right for you. You've just bought you from my bar, haven't you, to Hong Kong? Yeah, it's just a little bit good, isn't it? Well, I with it. How much have you got? We've got a regular hotel for about thirty-five dollars of damage to have nano. Just just over two pounds a day. That was without food, you know. Oh yeah, the price for the extra, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. Well you do, yeah. Instead of doing an eighteen month commission, if we cut it down to a year, do you think it'll be better? Uh, definitely. I'll offer a year commission, say, for the holiday for the wife to join you about halfway through. Yes, and give her a break. Yes, but who do you want to pay for this? The Navy, of course. The Navy has given much thought to finding the complete answer. Perhaps like most emotional problems, the answer will always be as complex as the problem. Shorter sea time, longer leave periods with family transported, free travel, air crew mid-tour leave, complete ship's companies interchanged by RAF Transport Command, all have been tried. A task force replaces land bases we're losing. A permanent land base accommodates wives and families. Dr. Anderson. How much for that, Joe? Five dollars. It's seen up, You were seen up. I remember a card seller on Tower Hill flogging 25-year-old picture postcards to continental sightseers at half a crown a time. That's how we know local peoples. As traders, stallholders and barkeepers who will see us off if we don't see them off. This is the captain speaking. As you all know well, we have been at sea for just on a month with 4 2 commando in Bath. Time to time, I have spoken to you and given you the state of play so far as I know it. But first, the background. You'll remember that for some time, trouble has been expected in this area. There has been an unhappy period of provocation. And we have been on the receiving end of all sorts of threats. Oh, no. Incursions no, 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 have been no. made every so often. But last night, news came through that landings in greater numbers have taken place. We are therefore closing the area with a view to carrying out an assault and putting in the Marines to bat at long last. They'll be up against ruthless, well-armed forces, and in addition, the locals are being terrorized and pillaged and have asked for help, so we shall have to do all we can to land supplies and medical teams. Now, the way that this is going to be tackled is from two separate areas. The northern one will be the concern of the victorious, be putting in her strikes there, and so she'll have little effort to spare to support us. In the south, we shall be landing the Marines by air and sea. And incidentally, this will be into, into an area of good thick jungle, which will make it tricky for both our helicopters and the Marines embarked in them. That is all the news for now, but I shall keep you informed as we go along. Action stations will be sounded off before dawn will need an all-out effort and long hours of work. However, we will give the Marines all the facilities and support which we can muster. Action within 24 hours. Now the captain is free to keep his officers and ship's company completely informed. The enemy has a few submarines and surface ships. Our job is to avoid an open engagement. A safe landing in the jungle of our Marines and stores is vital. Lieutenant Commander Penny is the schoolmaster. He's also the Met officer. Triangle. By using the sign rule, he is a mathematician that has to coach his students for GCE, O and A levels in the arts, sciences and languages. There is also the Navy's complex technocrat fields. The exam record is high. Chiefs, petty officers and ratings study together without embarrassment. The service helps. It needs men of high ability and training. Excuse me, sir. This tower we're having just now, will it delay the final G GCE exam at all? Oh, no, I don't think so. I've got the papers on board, so everything should go ahead as scheduled. Okay, thanks very much, sir. The situation at the moment is the tent and the escorts have closed up around us, and we're now proceeding to the assault area. Mm. Victorious is about 100 miles to the southwest. We'll be giving us distant air support, but I don't think she'll be able to support us once we're in the assault area. 
The RFAs are almost in position now. They will be by the time we get up there, and that should be all okay. Well, that's fine. That means there'll be no hold-up on the replenishment. Vic will certainly not be able to give us our cover during the assault. She's got further commitments up north. Well, it just occurred to me that if this assault goes according to plan, uh, we might have time tomorrow, late tomorrow afternoon, to do the refueling. I suggest you get in touch with the pilot and we can put that in play now and uh, make the necessary signal. Play call Q desk. Serial 26 ready in the hangar now. We should just be about on our turn now, pilot. Oh, uh, yes, I want to call 320 now. And that takes us up town onto the coast. Yes, sir. All right, I'll swap. C60 and come round to 320. Hi, right, Edgar. To get the Marines in, Bullock must thread her way through a group of enemy held islands. Hi, we're all right for um, speed. Uh, we're a little ahead, so I suggest we come down to 12 knots. Bulwark is driven by geared turbines developing a shaft horsepower of 78,000. Full boost, these drive her through the seas at 30 knots. The wheelhouse is down in the bowels of the ship. Aircraft launchings and landings, operational calls mean constant violent changes of speed. So our carrier's engines are under permanent stress and need unceasing care and maintenance. As in civilian life, the bakehouse works through the night. Here they produce over 500 loaves per day in four bakings and 2,000 buns and pastries. The buns are receiving the final happy polish. Whilst we race to our rendezvous, I'll try to explain a task force. Well, what is a task force? I've heard he called a fire brigade, well, that's only partly true. Peace force? Again, partly true. Then as Healy, the defence minister, once said, our role is to provide support for independent governments. That's true. Independent governments mean free speech. Freedom to decide and live one's own life. Responsibility to society in a responsible society. Well, basically, that's a belief in people. Now, people must communicate with people, exchange thoughts, trade, they must be free to do this without threat or fear. Let's see why we need a task force. A civilized community cannot afford to see communications, development and trade destroyed by rampaging irresponsible peoples. So a task force represents a responsible attitude towards the irresponsible. It's meant either by its presence, active intervention, to hold angry peoples at arm's length and to retire of swapping unnecessary punches. We fought two major wars, not just to win, but to retain our freedom. Even though today such freedom may be caricatured by angry scenes of football matches. Now the land bases are going back to the local peoples. Ironic comment that this same self-determination sometimes brings civil war and danger to the surrounding countries. The task force replaces the land bases. Complete within itself, it can be elusive and aggressive and it can move to the core of war. Here again is HMS Kent, the guided missile destroyer. Kent is the most advanced design in the world. You can see how the decks are completely enclosed. This is against nuclear attack. Captain Lewis RN, he commands a team of high ability, physicists, electrical and electronic graduates, nearly 500 crew in all. Sea slug and sea cat guided weapon systems can deal with attacks from the most modern aircraft at both close and long range.
HMS Zest, a frigate originally built as a destroyer. Our captain, Commander Fidian Green RN, is a fleet air arm pilot. Zest has a multi-purpose role, from anti-submarine screen to a strike carrier's guard ship during night flying. Again, training never ceases. Pilots are receiving the penultimate briefing. Mike Hutton is speaking. Hi, gentlemen. The last test flight's just been completed. Now, so far, you've heard the outline plan for the whole operation and the forces taking part and the opposition that we may expect to meet. And the Colonel has also covered the full military briefing on his intentions and what he plans to do when we've got the command air ashore. Lieutenant Scott, our pilot of tomorrow, he will take in Corporal Gibson's stick on the ship tomorrow, and if there's anything you don't understand, this is the time to raise any problem. Topside's final tests are being carried out. Maintenance, constant care. Let off, sir, please. Well, gentlemen, the shear line is just north of the exercise area, so the winds tomorrow will be southwest at light. It's likely to be partly cloudy and cloudy. Lieutenant Commander Penny, the schoolmaster, wearing his meteorology hat. Visibility will be good, apart from in the showers, and I think the temperature will rise to perhaps 29 degrees centigrade during the day. The smooth organization getting the Marines away tomorrow at dawn is the responsibility of Major Tony Eyre, here with Lieutenant Ray Ingram, Royal Marines, responsible for the stores and equipment. Um, because Jumbo and um, the ship's crane will be working loading LCAs and uh, the pontoons. The pressure around 1,000 to 50 feet. Are there any questions? How about Mobet? Um, Mobets, I think we'd better put right forward on the island, um, up by the company dumps. Yes. And um, then, with your stores up there, we should have those away by um, halfway through the forenoon, and then we shall um, get on to the uh, logistic phase of which we come. Uh, Start up Channel 4, over to 3, and take off on Channel Lieutenant 1. Lieutenant Jones, number 2 operations officer. He's a fleet air arm observer. And on breaking of the stream, chop to Channel 4, at the chop line here, and call forward control. Flight supply. The first wave will go in at tackle height, as briefed by the squadron commander. Thereafter, in at 200 feet, and back at 400 feet. Are there any questions, please? Squadron Commander, please. Lieutenant Commander Tank Sherman, 845 Squadron's Commander. He has flown hundreds of hours in the jungles of Borneo and knows the hazards they will meet tomorrow. I'm straight ahead on ship's track, 200 feet, then turn straight onto the salt heading. All these boys have spent long periods in jungle areas. Five knots till 36 four pulled all aboard. Straight in at uh, 200 feet until I've got a horizon I can see by, and I'll drop straight down as low as I can. Uh, don't get below me, you'll be okay. I can mean, hardly tell you that surprise is of the greatest importance on this type of encounter. We should be crossing the coast to the south of the landing site, turning north and running straight in. We will see the landing site on the airport craft, so there shouldn't be any problem. We're aiming to land where the enemy isn't, but uh, we can't be 100% certain about this. So in case of unexpected opposition, uh, all pairs leaders will mount side-mounted machine guns. They're in defense, and all number two will carry fixed form of firing armaments. 
Barbonat, SOB. We return to the ship, break down to the screen, and the boat up as rapid as possible. All clear? the starboard bow and the first British aircraft, the first wave will be on spot one. Lieutenant three. Commander Sean McPhail, second in command flying. You've seen him before. A distinguished pilot. Will be sorted starboard side. The aircraft will be launched in the order of the Hiller first, going starboard, the SAR second, uh, followed by the first wave of assault aircraft. And as soon as the spots are clear, the uh, aircraft for the second assault wave will be rain on the spot. Standard operating procedures derived. Are there any questions? Tomorrow, these boys will be in the jungle protecting people they have not met. Dangerous, lonely, exciting, calling for all the skills they've acquired in other jungles. Tonight, like any other group of men anywhere, in workshops, in pubs or clubs, they argue. Football, cars, women, or anything. You name it, the men will argue about it. This is Robert Barr. Here is a classic, horrifying case of if only. If only these people had armed themselves. If only they had not trusted their neighbors. If only the politicians had not been forced to sit balancing delicate arguments against indelicate threats. If only this unhappy country had asked for help much earlier. If only. Perhaps these appalling scenes of terror, devastation, death and degradation need not have been. Who are we to say if only? If only we had stopped Hitler much earlier, stopped the evils of the concentration camps. But like these poor devils, we hoped and somehow could not believe. In Bulwark, we are now closed up racing along about 30 knots. We have had reports of the unhappy position ashore. All is tense, yet without unnecessary tension. Since the land is quite secure, I think the intention is to go up towards Eagle's Claw, where we have one company of the enemy. I see. The Colonel has um, decided that Eagle's Claw must be the first objective to clear the way for our logistic support coming in over Queen Green. And this will be taken by the second company coming over Queen Red. Um, first of all, we must secure that Blue 1 and Blue 3 landing site, and that will be assaulted by the helicopter borne company, which will be Alpha Company. As soon as they are ashore, they will split up. One troop will go up the road, and the other two troops we want to lift ground by helicopter to do a hook round the rear of Eagle's Fort. With the latest intelligence, the Colonel is quite confident that one company will be sufficient to take their feet. That will mean taking four helicopters out of the stream to Blue One to take the trips round to Eagle's Claw. Yes, it will be, of course, sir. Look, I've got you both um, up here before we get down to the final briefing. Is there's a minor drama. For the initial launch, the ship is now forced to operate a few miles further away than we originally planned. But for the actual touchdown, the assault, um, this is going to be a all right, and we can increase the fuel by an extra 200 pounds. And sure, the captain says he can give me another five knots of wind over the deck. So we'll just launch that little bit earlier, and I reckon all will do well. You happy, Jack? Yes, well, I see no problem there, sir. With the extra five knots over the deck, we'll be right with the extra 200 pounds weight on takeoff. And of course, we'll have burnt off more fuel and be approximately the same weight at the landing site. The only thing it will affect is that on return back to the ship, our fuel margins will be lower. So we'll have to get on without any delay. Yes, I, I see no problem for the launch or recovery. We're well within the limits for engaging rotors yeah. and for landing and takeoff. Yeah. Right? And if we have briefing 10 minutes before we have normally planned. Fine. Okay. The early call. Two hours from now, these boys will be in the jungle. Come on. Get a movement. Come on. Take a move. This was to be Anderson's GCE day. He faces a very different test. What kind of this morning, Daddy? This is morning. 
Ah, civilized what? Two five zero. Two five zero. Let's see your final fetch for us. Yes. All right, Officer Watch. Come on, two five zero. Aye, aye, sir. Marines waiting there. I guess the final call to the flight deck. our pilot has received his final briefing. Soon he will be flying into jungle area with trees 200 feet high, finding small areas to drop his marines. Corporal Gibson and his stick. Each Marine has a check card. This is handed in before he embarks. Our old friend the schoolmaster collects these cards and helps marshal the Marines on the flight deck. Each section of Marines is called a stick. A stick is eight to ten men under a corporal. Gibson's stick in bars. they stream out, up from the bowels of the ship and then down into the bowels of the jungle. Why did they do it? What makes them choose this way to live against working in an office, factory, or as commercial travellers, or even professional footballers? Simplify the issues. Someone is being hurt. They are going to stop it. Oh, much too simple. It's not just that. These men are not moralists or missionaries. Talk to them of moralities, Hand them Bibles and patriotic marching songs and they'll look at you with some amusement. Of course helicopter flying is fun. Landing and taking off from a sliding flight deck. 
constant low flying. It calls for skill and so many permutations of any one given situation. Flying over the jungle stretches the nerves. Add an unseen enemy waiting to bang away and the tingling edges up. Low flying through the trees. Holding one's height when one small error means disaster. training and trust in the machine. Chopper boys claim it's the best of all flying worlds. Look at the low flying it can do, legally. One thing these men know for sure is that their real master is Her Majesty's government. They do not move unless ordered to do so by Her Majesty's government. Service life, soldiering with its known discomforts, its known dangers, is to these men an accepted way of life. It offers a personal challenge and excitement. It has its own freedoms, its own loyalties. It is an interdependence upon each other and so its own responsibility. It keeps you alert and wary. When they see the damage caused, the mutilated bodies, the bereaved children, the women crying over the dead, like us, they'll be moved to tears and then to blinding anger, for they are ordinary men. Like us, they'll be bemused by man's bestiality to man, then they'll get on with the job of clearing up the mess. Our sea vixens have covered Bulwark's assault. We're now steaming full bore to join HMS Eagle. We've heard that Eagle's squadrons have already caused considerable confusion. A young pilot is inspecting his aircraft. Now this time, they did not have to rush. In an emergency, of course, they can scramble in 30 seconds. Today, everything is going as planned. Uh, this is Lieutenant Hamilton. He's typical of today's air crew. Shuttle the aircraft in the exact takeoff position. The angled deck allows aircraft to be stacked forward in a clear runway for landings and takeoffs. again. Strops attach the shuttle and the aircraft is literally catapulted into the air. Here's the shuttle being attached to the strop.
guard helicopters in the background. There's the shot again. So they go. One every 20 seconds. Three a minute. We are now sending in the third wave of Marines. There is a terrifying inevitability in this steady, regular march of men. There is no dashing around, no apparent urgent agitation. They run to the aircraft, that's all. The training, the constant rehearsing, the planning have brought this operation to its smooth, unscampered efficiency. This way is the fast way. Several hundred Marines can be airborne every 15 minutes. So the build-up goes on. the seaborne landing is on. They are going into an area cleared by the Marines. This is affectionately known as Dumbo. You will notice that the Remis are here. Combined force operations are no longer a new concept. The Ministry of Defence is the logical outcome of such thought. We may be moving into an era of complete integration. We know that we are only the leaseholders of our land bases. We are the freeholders of a task force. A task force is not meant for the global nuclear holocaust we all dread. The Navy's main role has been guarding the sea lanes and shepherding men and supplies from base to base. Of course, this has entailed major naval actions. But the Navy's role is changing and it is no longer just an escort. So the degree of cooperation may change. The scenes you have been watching are normal cooperation, Army, Marines and Navy. But the Army has only a small role in this part of the operation. This could change. Without a land base, the army may have to be at sea for weeks, not just in troop ships, but living with the navy in new commando assault ships. This will call for considerable emotional and personal readjustments. All prejudices and shibboleths must go. The army side will still fight in the deserts, plains and jungles, but its base could be the carrier. Indeed, HMS Fearless is the new assault ship designed for such work. The captain fights and controls his ship from the ops room. Modern naval craft are designed for this, the captain on the bridge is now like a dodo. The recce troop is moving south down the road towards Comic Nest, where we think the other enemy company is. The third enemy company, which is spread out over Vulture's Beak, is giving rather more trouble than we expected and may have to be dealt with. Now, what about the reserve company on board? Are we likely to have to land them? 
Well, that's yours, I think. Yes, sir, I've just heard from the Colonel, and in fact, he would like to bring in the reserve company. He intends to bring them in to relieve Alpha Company, who have been holding the landing site. And then once that is completed, Alpha Company will push down the road to the southeast behind the wreckage. That should be all right. And the build-up, is that going to into plan? Yes, sir. We shall have choppers to do the job with. We shall be on the logistic build-up then, and we shall just take four off and use it for the company lift, and it'll just slow the build-up down a little. Corporal Gibson's stick has advanced into the steaming, hot, wet jungle. Apart from the natural hazard, there is an adept, agile and unseen enemy. You learn to move without sound, without trace. You accept the violent, heavy, tacky heat, the dark and the wet, where every step, every move seems to sap the marrow, suck at your energy. You learn to trust, you have to trust. Soon our AF helicopter and strike aircraft will be brought into the landing strips cleared by the Marines. Loss of land bases and some overflying rights not only affect the Army, Navy and their future integration, but the RAF. The task force desperately needs the RAF long-range transport jets, not only for urgent technical supplies, but to interchange complete ships' companies and so maintaining fresh alert efficiency. The task force might have to accept a very close integration with the RAF. Here is the reason for a task force, to prevent this kind of senseless terror, or at least localize it. Today the task force seems the answer, maybe there are others. We have seen but one aspect of the work. In a civilized world we must accept some responsibility. Responsibility is collective. We know the wasting terrors of war. We should take some part in preventing it happening anywhere. It is the people you see here who suffer. Theirs is the loneliness of abject despair. And so the work goes on. A tight, dependent community, working for a people they have not met and may never meet. Like manufacturers making foods for people they do not know. In a strange, bizarre way, these boys are also helping the export drive so urgently demanded by the government. Goods can only be traded in a peaceful world. All this costs money. All the stores you've seen poured into the jungle. The vast quantities of fuel used. To train a pilot costs 24,000 pounds. 
An average unmarried lieutenant receives over £1,500 a year. Each Wessex helicopter costs £190,000, consumes 100 gallons per hour in these conditions. Six hours flying uses 600 gallons of fuel per day for one helicopter. Victorious is restoring. Brassic, we call it in service. Here's the captain and officer of the Royal Fleet Auxiliary Reliant, one of the supply ships needed to keep the Navy at sea. They're civilian men. They cover thousands of miles pumping food, the multitude of technical stores and fuel into the fleet. If we lost Singapore as a base, the fleet would have to be serviced from Australia or elsewhere. And this would demand many more ships. They operate alone, the supply line stretched, they may have to be convoyed. Victorious, with his crew of 1,400 seamen and technicians, plus four squadrons, another 400, nearly 1,800 men, consumes even more food than Bullock, needs more fuel. In fact, nearly twice as much. Bullock, with a full complement of Marine commandos, will also have nearly 1,800 to feed. They will eat 6,400 pounds of meat per week. Enough meat for an average family of four for eight years. 1,100 pounds of sausages, 19,510 pounds of potatoes, 10,000 eggs, 2,200 pounds of fresh fruit, 1,200 cartons of ice cream, and so on. That's only a week's supply. Now add all the military stores and supplies to keep the shore forces going. Add the immense capital investment. Victorious, with her many refits, is worth around 40 million pounds. Her aircraft, 25 million. Bulwark is worth about 30 million pounds. Her aircraft, around 2 million pounds. Here's the Gannet giving Bulwark air cover during the RAS. Add the other ships comprising the task force, and there is a capital investment of over 250 million pounds. Pay must compare with civilian pay. A petty officer can make over 25 pounds a week. Most of that can be saved. The married men are buying their own houses through mortgage schemes arranged by the Navy. The highly skilled, expensively trained personnel. Well, the exam goes ahead as planned. These men are part of our new world. Yet we force them to live outside reality. Their news of current events is but headlines. They live in a vacuum of out-of-date newspapers. The Navy is aware of the problem. Most ships publish a daily broadsheet. This is sweated out by an enthusiastic volunteer editorial staff in between regular duties. Ashore, they see the local newspapers, usually adolescent, parochial and naive. Every ship has its own small 16mm portable cinema. Most TV, current affairs, documentary and feature programs are or could be on 16mm and so be seen by the Navy. They never are. Why? No one has given me a good reason. Bulwark has a highly qualified medical staff and good facilities. As soon as the Marines have completed their task here, they will be withdrawn and taken up north. Bulwark not only brings the Marines to the area, but acts as depot ship, hospital, etc. Uh, where the helicopter mark is. He should have been back about ten minutes ago, and he's not back. It's getting a little late. Ironic that the smoothest way for getting the wounded below is on the bomb lift. The surgeon commander has a fine group working with him, a well-equipped theatre. I think um, it'd probably be dangerous to send any further choppers into that area. Uh, what I suggest that is, is that as soon as Charlie Company are firm on the position, that they push forward a foot patrol into the area where the helicopter was last seen and see if they can report anything.
so, the work goes on. I sure. I see. I've just heard from the HCT that Delta is definitely shot down in position about here. Just about the patrol position, isn't it, Jeff? Captain, this is Ops. We've just had confirmation that Delta is down, almost in the position where she put the patrol in. You've seen today's concept of task force at work. It must be ready for action or any duty anywhere, wherever the government of the day may send it. Is there a justification for this immense effort, this police work, this vast expense? Once again, quote Dennis Healy. First of all, we've got direct obligations to defend and to keep order in countries which are still under British rule, like Hong Kong in the Far East, Swaziland in Southern Africa. And secondly, we've treaty obligations to help countries either in the Commonwealth, like Malaysia, or outside it, like Kuwait, which feel themselves threatened by foreign enemies. You know, we just can't welch on these obligations. But there's a third and more general reason why we are east of Suez today. Very often, just by having troops around, we can help to prevent a war breaking out, or stop it from spreading when it does break out. That's in fact what we did in East Africa two years ago. We hadn't been able to send troops in when we were asked by the independent governments. The whole of East Africa might have been plunged into chaos like the Congo, in fact, was. And don't forget, we walk out of a country that other countries around may walk in. In fact, if we're wanted in a country and we walk out, we may leave behind us nothing but violence and anarchy. <laughs> well, there's the justification. The task force, in the distinct form you've seen, can work until the mid-70s. From then on, the heart of this particular concept, the carriers, will be the end of their operational careers. The Defence Review plans a very different navy and but suggests a new concept for task force work. The peoples who today need the presence and protection of a task force, if not its active intervention, might still need support after the 1970s. We can't assume that within ten years they will have found stability, democratic governments and administrations suitable to their distinct needs and cultures and not mere copies of the West. The Western world has been a wary peace. Can we expect others to mature politically and socially faster than the West? We hope that the Western world will never again rend itself with a conventional war. But we know that this could rapidly escalate to a nuclear holocaust. The Middle and Far East may see a whole series of conflagrations. As a colonial power, our record was no worse and in most cases better than other colonial administrations. But we are responsible for many of the problems. We owe stability to these people, whilst they emerge from bewildered illiteracy through emotional literacy to stable government. So a task force is essential. Well, what shape we take? We're to lose the cannon. But somehow troops and supplies must be got in, airstrips cleared. So we must have ships and helicopters, plus close support strike aircraft. We have the new assault ships planned. One, HMS Fearless, is already operational. We have fine escorts. Kent, London, Ajax, etc., and others in our building were planned. Today, the lower deck is crammed with skilled technicians who live and be paid according to their merits with financial returns and prospects equal to their civilian counterparts. The wardroom offers opportunities for grammar school boys, physicists, the technocrats, and of course the leader. And this will not change in ten years. Perhaps the governments will integrate all three services, who knows? If so, the Navy will be an integral part of such a command. But whatever happens, if we accept our obligations, the Navy will still be in a central service after the 1970s. Fact and definitive statements cannot be made. All that can be said is that the future is still very open. The stable Middle and Far East will bring immense financial benefits and returns from the exports we must make to live. We cannot afford to make consumer goods, which we must consume ourselves, because world markets are barred to us. In the 1920s to 30s, we wrapped ourselves in cosy cotton wool, believing in a perfect world. Or rather, not wishing to believe in an imperfect world. Alas, we live in an imperfect world. We are part of and responsible for many of its imperfections. In the perfect world, there will be no place for task force, no place for police, customs officers. Inspectors of taxes, politicians. Perhaps in the place of God. Meanwhile, we should pray. <laughs>